you will. And let's uh, go to Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. I'm going to actually do what I said I would do this morning. Um, I'm going to uh, speak on the subject of the assurance of salvation. And I want to begin with uh, these verses in Romans chapter number 8. And verses 15 and 16, and I'll introduce... Take a few minutes to introduce the um, study for tonight. But notice in verse number 15 of Romans chapter number 8, the Bible says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Bible also says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And so God has written the scriptures to us so that we can know that we have eternal life. It is God's intention that every saved person know that they're saved. And I... I Hope we can agree on that. What I'm going to share with you tonight, uh, let me just give you a little bit of the background or history of it. Um, Growing up in church and around ministry and um, and then entering ministry uh, when I was uh, the age of 22, almost 23, entering the ministry. And that's been a lot of years ago. Uh, so, uh, back in uh, mid-1983 uh, that I entered the ministry. And <clears throat> working with teenagers, bus workers, and then uh, pastoring as well. Um, you, you see something replay itself over and over again. And that is uh, church members, Christian folks, folks who've been raised in church, hitting points in their life where they say, well, I'm not really sure that I'm saved. And typically what would happen when that comes up, somebody maybe is dealing with them at the altar, and typically what would happen is they would say, well, you know what to do to be saved, so why don't you go ahead and pray and get saved? And they would pray a prayer, but I noticed that it would repeat that the same person, about every, depending on the person, six months to a year, maybe a year and a half, would go through the same cycle. And as a pastor, that troubled me because I did not, um, I know that people are different. Some people are less trusting across the board than others, but, um, but that can't be the only reason. And I felt like there's something something missing in our process and what we're doing. And so I began a, a long, a lengthy search of, I, I, don't, I didn't have a start date and a finish date, but it had to be well over five years, probably closer to six or seven years, that I prayed about it, studied it, uh, whenever something would come up that I thought fit into uh, the, uh, the whole discussion, I would take some time and concentrate on it, And then I would just get a few things settled in my mind and I would set it aside. You know, I think sometimes we we, uh, see something a little bit different or a little bit new and we jump on it. We want to, you know, it's like, you know, you got to have the flash news report. Uh, When you're dealing with uh, the truth of God's word and and eternal doctrine, um, it doesn't hurt to be sure of what you're going to say. And so after quite a few years of, of prayer and study, um, I began utilizing uh, what I'm going to show you tonight. It's, it's uh, some of you have heard me present this, uh, either personally or a little bit publicly or just little bits of it 
in a message, but I don't know, I, I cannot remember if I've ever just laid it out because I've never had notes for it. Tonight is a landmark. I actually have a few notes uh, so that I can be as orderly as possible uh, because it's not really something that I set out to outline as much as I did as I set out to uh, put a tool in my hand to try to help people. And when you're talking to someone, uh, it's not really an outline that you're following. It depends on their questions and where they're coming from. But I, I do believe I, I found some things that might not be the whole answer, but I believe it's a large part of the answer for dealing with the assurance of salvation. And I don't want to just share it with you tonight. Now, what prompted this is uh, there were some people, and uh, without giving you names or anything, they you know, would, would cycle through my office every, few, every year, year and a half. Well, I'm, I'm doubting my salvation, or I'm not sure I'm saved. And, uh, and I, when I first began to try to adjust or change the way I was dealing with and counseling with people, on this subject, I began by, by just asking the question, what or who are you doubting? In other words, are you doubting that God would save you if you were, if you were sincere? Or are you doubting that you knew enough or that you were sincere? Or what, what exactly are you doubting? Now, the answer 100% of the time was that they were doubting something on their end. The purpose of the question was not that I thought that they would be doubting God. The purpose of the question was trying to identify the source of the doubt. In other words, well, I, 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 didn't, I don't know if I knew enough. Well, what is it that you have to know uh, to get saved? And, 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 I, and I found that there was a little bit of help with that direction, but, but it was just the beginning. Um. And in all those years of trying to help people uh, from, uh, from early in my ministry in 1983 on through uh, what would have been, I, I don't know, uh, you know, the uh, mid, mid uh, you know, 2000, 2005 or so, um, I, I noticed this, that what, uh, and I began to ask myself, what is it that people are, is causing them to doubt or question? What, what, what is the, the, the overriding kind of a theme that, that I hear? And then what is it that I observe? And one of the things I observed uh, was that if somebody came and said to me, Pastor Wagonshoes, I'm not sure if I'm saved, and I would say, well, you know, you know, if you call upon the name of the Lord, that you'll be saved, and, and so why don't you go ahead and do that? And they would do something like this. They would say, Lord, you know, uh, I know Jesus died on the cross for me. If I'm not saved, then save me. And we would say they got the assurance of salvation. The, the trouble is that in that context, I don't find that in the Bible of somebody getting that kind, I believe that we find in the Bible, the assurance of our salvation. I believe it does assure us of, of the truth of salvation. But getting, getting the assurance of our salvation uh, was, I, was part of what I identified as that maybe that what the very basics of what we're doing is wrong. That and then if we're saying, well, just you know what to do, just go ahead and pray. And they say, Lord, if I'm not saved, then save me. And uh, got, get the assurance of their salvation. And I found out that they weren't any more assured than they had been before. And, and so I began to identify. And one of the keys that stood out to me when I began to pray about it, think about it, study the word of God about it, was that they were praying a prayer, Lord, if I'm not saved. One of the main things that we teach when we're trying to teach people to be soul winners is you can't get someone saved until they first are what? Lost. If someone does not understand that they're lost, 
they can't, we say they can't get saved. If they do not accept, if they do not agree, if they won't admit that they're lost, they can't get saved. Because to get saved, you have to have been lost. And so what we were doing unintentionally was simply reinforcing the doubt by them praying, saying, Lord, if I'm not saved. My attention was brought to Jesus Christ on the cross. Where one said, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. But the other one said what? Lord, if thou be the son of God. And there's no one that believes that man was saved. He prayed an if prayer. Lord, if thou be the son of God, save thyself and save us too. He did not know Jesus to be God. He was just taking a chance on if he was God. And if if someone prays a prayer, Lord, if I'm not saved, Lord, if you're really there, Lord, if there is a heaven and if there is a hell and if the Bible is real and 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 if Santa Claus is coming to town and and if you know if there really are uh, leprechauns, uh, you know, you know, I do believe in fairies and and all of the other little ifs and maybes wasn't getting them any actual assurance of their salvation. So I want to share with you some of the things that that God put in place in my heart that I've used with other people and God seems to have blessed it. But, But let me put this caveat right at the beginning. And that is, this is not meant to deal with someone who believes in works for salvation. If someone is inundated with false doctrine, you correct the false doctrine. If someone believes that, you know, baptism saves, you correct the false doctrine of baptismal regeneration. If they believe that their good works must that way, their bad works, you correct the false doctrine. This is, this is more intended for a group like this. It's more intended for a group of people who've grown up in church. You understand truth or the right doctrine that salvation is by grace uh, through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You're not questioning whether or not the the Bible is the word of God. You're you're just wondering whether or not your uh, profession of faith is valid, whether or not you're genuinely born into the family of God because, you know, we get, we get our, our spirit and our mind get tangled up and we begin to question and wonder. And there's a reason for it. I'm going to talk about it in just a moment. But, uh, but it's not, this is not with somebody is dealing with false doctrine or under false assumptions about, about salvation. This is somebody who believes the truth about the Word of God. They're just questioning whether or not they are genuinely saved. And let me say, first of all, the first major uh, key or pu- uh, uh, part of this puzzle is to understand the work of the Holy Spirit. To understand the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit. Notice with me in John chapter number sixteen. Go with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter sixteen, and I encourage you to, if you're at all concerned about these kinds of things and want to help people, make notes. And you know, this might not be something you use every day. So if you find a place to to put this in uh, one of those uh, white blank pages at the beginning or end of your Bible or your New Testament might be a good place to put it. Maybe uh, create your own chain. Uh, I remember when uh, people, years ago when I used to teach soul winning classes and people were not used to witnessing, I would, I would have them create a chain in their Bible that in the front of their New Testament or whatever they would be using to witness to people, uh, they would put, uh, you know, the first verse. They would put Romans 3.10. Just write it in the front and then go to Romans 3.10. And next to Romans 3.10, they would uh, put a reference to Romans 3.23. And, and, they, and so you create a chain so that you don't have to depend on, on memory. And you can do the same thing with what I'm telling you tonight. Uh, create a chain in your New Testament or in your Bible. 
uh, for later reference. Because I've been thinking about this for many, many years. And, uh, and so it's, it's just maybe new to you. I don't expect you to remember this uh, just at one setting. But notice in uh, John chapter 16 and verses 7 through 13, uh, Jesus Christ explained the work of the Holy Spirit when he would come, the work of the Holy Spirit regarding salvation or his part in promoting the salvation of the world. And verse number seven, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Let me hit the pause button there. By way of interpretation, I believe the reason that Jesus says, if I don't go away, the comforter will not come is because the work of, think about the work of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, he, he uh, formed the plan of salvation. Jesus Christ came to Bethlehem, lived a perfect sinless life, died on the cross of Calvary, and, uh, and went to the grave. Three days, three nights later, rose again, ascends, ascends to the right hand of God. He did the work of redemption. And then the Holy Spirit, as we're going to see in a moment, the Holy Spirit is the one that comes into the world and reveals to men that they are sinners and Jesus is the only way. That means this, the work of the Holy Spirit cannot start until the work of Jesus has finished. And so I believe it's a simple matter of Jesus saying, until my work is finished, the Holy Spirit can't begin his work. I think that's why he says, until I go away, the comforter will not come. All right, now let's go back to it. Then verse number eight, and when he has come, that's the Holy Spirit, the comforter, when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And he goes on to say, I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when the Spirit, uh, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Let's focus on verses 9, 10, and 11. Um, uh, verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. When the Comforter comes, he will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then he explains each of those points. Of sin, in verse 9, because they believe not on me. So the first business of the Holy Spirit in the life of a lost person is to reveal them to them and re rebuke them because they are an unrepentant sinner. Because they have not put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are lost and on their way to hell. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. I can tell you this. The knowledge of sin was with me from an early age. Because children who grow up in church are confronted with sin very much earlier than children who aren't brought up in church. But the awareness that I was lost, that's something the Holy Spirit did when I was 21 years old. I believe he was trying to do so earlier. There was a time when I was, I want to say about 9 or 10 I made a profession of faith when I was five. Um, honestly, I don't remember it. I, I was told about it. And so when you're told about something, if I told you about something I saw this week over in Michigan, your mind would begin to create an image based upon what my, my description. And it, your image might not be close to what I saw, because I may not be able to describe it very well, but your mind creates an image. And what happened is I believe that my mind created an image uh, because I don't remember going forward when I was five. But I, but I was told he went forward when you're five in a vacation Bible school. When I was, um, I'm not sure, eight, nine, ten, somewhere in there, I was under conviction, didn't know what about. And uh, I remember uh, was at uh, a men's, a little men's prayer meeting thing and, and my dad had uh, taken me there with him and and I, and I was under conviction about something. And because he assumed that I was saved, he said, well, maybe God's calling you to preach. 
Now, what was God doing at that time in my life? I have no idea. Uh, I just know I felt uh, him speaking to my heart, but I didn't know what it was about. Uh, but, but then from that time until I was 21, um, I don't remember, I mean, I remember feeling bad about doing bad stuff, uh, but not really a conviction, not really a, uh, I just knew I shouldn't be doing it. Uh, more, more a little bit of the conscience than the Holy Spirit. But man, when the Holy Spirit turned the light on and revealed to me that I was lost, that's exactly what he's talking about here in verse number nine. A sin because they believe not on me. Then of righteousness, notice this, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Now what's that talking about? I believe here's what it's talking about. The righteousness of Christ is revealed in his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to the right hand of God the Father, because he is righteous, he is accepted with the Father. His righteousness is on full display in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he's, it shows that he is righteous because God the Father accepted his sacrifice. And so the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will... Reprove the world of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father. In other words, he will show the world that I am righteousness. That I'm the only hope. And then thirdly, of judgment, verse 11, because the prince of this world is judged. So it's looking ahead to a future and final judgment. Let me ask you a question, church. Is Satan the only one who will be judged in the future? And the answer is no. But Satan will be judged. And guess what? All those whose names were not found written in the Lamb's book of life were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So the Holy Spirit's job, when he would come, which he came right after Jesus Christ ascended to the Father, he Holy Spirit came and he began to reveal to men that they are lost and on their way to hell. Jesus Christ is the only hope because he alone is righteous and judgment is coming and is sure on those who do not accept Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So let me ask you a question. What lost people does the Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit responsible for? to reveal their lostness to. Only the unchurched lost people or all lost people? It's not a trick question. I'm just asking you to, to think and use reason and use logic. What is it? All lost people. Uh, only, only lost people in a third world country or lost people in the United States of America as well. The United States of America as well. Only lost people that are drunkards or even lost people that are good people? Well, the answer is he's responsible to reveal to every lost person that they need Jesus Christ. That means this, that the job of telling me whether that I am lost is the Holy Spirit. Amen? It's not the pastor. It's not mom and dad. It's the Holy Spirit's job to tell me that I am lost. All right, now, we already read uh, in, uh, oh, okay, let me put this in and then I've got to go back and cover something I already touched on. But notice this, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, I'm going to touch on this now. It will become important, more important even later on as we try to draw things to a conclusion, but I want to show it to you right now because it belongs here. Ephesians chapter 6. And verse number 17. Ephesians chapter 6. And verse number 17. The Bible says, And take the helmet of salvation, and read this out loud with me. Ready? Begin. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. All right, now, so the sword of the Spirit is 
the Word of God. The, word, the Holy Spirit's job in a lost world is to convict us of our lostness, to reveal the righteousness of Christ, and to warn of, of impending future and eternal judgment. And he uses the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to do that. So when we give the gospel to someone, we give them not Baptist theology, we give them Bible doctrine. We don't have them read uh, a book of Baptist history or we don't have them uh, look up you know, different edicts or whatever or, or the uh, such, such and such confession of faith. We, no, we say, here's what the Bible says. Why? Because it is the Holy Spirit's job to reveal to them that they are lost and what he uses is the word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. Now that's going to become important in just a few minutes. I said a, a few moments ago that uh, the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 8, verses 15 and 16, where we opened tonight, it said, um, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So if you are a child of God, you are saved. Amen? You with me? Say amen. Uh, and so it is the Holy Spirit's job to tell a saved person that you are saved. This is the Holy Spirit's job to tell a lost person that you are lost, all right? So the job of the Holy Spirit is to confirm your salvation or to reveal that you are lost. Regarding salvation, that's the two jobs the Holy Spirit has to do. There is nowhere in the Bible, it does not exist, there is nowhere in the Bible that shows that the Holy Spirit would ever tell a lost person, maybe you're saved. There is nowhere in the Bible that the Holy Spirit would tell a saved person, maybe you're lost. And when someone is saying to me or saying to you, I'm not sure whether I'm saved or lost. I know this one thing, and this is one of the first big for lack of a better term, aha moments in my study of this topic was when I realized the Holy Spirit never says maybe. The Holy Spirit never tells someone, maybe you're lost. He never tells someone, maybe you're saved. He has no interest in that. What could possibly what can he possibly hope to accomplish by telling... Now, if a person is lost, what's he got to accomplish by telling them they're lost? Maybe they'll realize he gets saved. What does he have to accomplish if he tells a saved person uh, that you are saved? I'll tell you, well, let's uh, go with me to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. And verse number one, Hebrews chapter six and verse number one. Uh, if you backed up into chapter five, you would find that in verse 12, for when the time, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even those who have by reason of use, by their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So it's saying, listen, if you're saved and you've not yet grown to use the Bible as strong meat, then you're like uh, someone who ought to be teaching, but you need taught again so that you can grow to where you can use the Bible skillfully, Right? So then in verse number one of chapter six, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. The word perfection there, as it is often used in the Bible, does not mean sinlessness, but it does lead, you know, this phrase has been with me. I haven't used it publicly until this moment. It's been with me for about two months that the Holy Spirit of God has been just kind of just rolling this over in my mind that we're not talking about sinlessness, but we all are talking about sinning less. Not sinless, but sinning less. 
And I'm striving in that area to sin less. But he says, let us go on to perfection or maturity. Let's, let's leave the principles. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to people that have not had their senses exercised to discern good and evil. They've not gotten to the place where they can be teachers yet, but they still have need. You know, this is somebody who's saved, should be teaching, but because they have stunted spiritual growth, they cannot yet teach these things. But he says, but let's get this settled and leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ and go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, doctrine of baptism, laying on of hands of eternal judgment. This we will do if God permit. And he goes on and talks about uh, the assurance of salvation. It's impossible if you were once enlightened, if you've tasted the heavenly gift, uh, the, the heavenly gift uh, to lose your salvation. And, and we can go into that, but that's a different it's really a different uh, topic or a different part of this topic. And so what does the Holy Spirit do regarding salvation? If you are a, a person on the street, if you're a church member, if you are a pastor, the Holy Spirit tells you, yes, you're saved or no, you're not. He tells you you're lost or you're saved. He never tells you maybe. He's, I've had somebody, I had a pastor one time argue with me. Well, maybe he says maybe to get someone to doubt it. I said, show it to me in the Bible. Show it to me in the Bible. This, the, the Holy Spirit, if you're saved, he wants you confirmed. I mean, he wants you assured. He wants you uh, having the knowledge of your salvation. He, th these things are written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. He has no interest in you being wishy-washy on your own salvation. Now, let's talk about, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's talk about the work of Satan. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. I, I realize I'm giving you more than you would use in dealing with someone because I'm giving you the background. I'm giving you the scriptures that lead to these realizations. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. And it just, it hasn't really been that long since I started preaching. It just feels long, right? <laughs> I know it just feels long. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4 and verses 3 through 6. Notice what the Bible says. If our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And he goes on to talk about the treasure we have in earthen vessels. But notice this. What is the job, what is the work of the Holy Spirit, excuse me, of, the, of Satan regarding salvation and the lost man? He tries to keep the light of the gospel from shining into their heart. What does that light do? That light reveals that they are lost and that Christ convict, reproves the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Amen? You still with me? Say amen. And, the, and blinding them keeps that from happening. Think about, just like we thought about the Holy Spirit and his desire for man. He wants a lost man to know he's lost so he gets saved. He wants a saved man to know he's saved so he'll have uh, the courage of his convictions and he'll go on and be fruitful and productive as a child of God, not laying again the foundation of repentance, dead works, etc. Right? But, this, but Satan is the exact opposite. Because if there's a man that's lost, Satan wants him to think he's okay, probably. Probably okay. You know, probably everyone's going to heaven. Probably your good works will outweigh your bad works. He is a blinder of the light because he does not want you to know that you're lost. Why? Because if you know you're lost, there's a chance you might get saved. 
The person that's saved, the devil does not want you to have the assurance of your salvation. Because if he can say to the saved person, if he can say to you, well, you know, did you really mean it? How much did you know? Were you sincere? Were you facing east? You know, <laughs> was it a King James Bible they were quoting to you? And, and, and on and on, all of these things that Satan wants to cause you to question, why would he do that if you are saved? Because he does not want you to be uh, that person that we just read about for the time you ought to be teachers. He doesn't want you sharing Christ with anybody else. He wants you floundering, not sure of your own salvation. So Satan never says to a saved person, you're saved. Never says to a lost person, you're lost. He always says, maybe. But the Holy Spirit never says to a saved person, maybe you're lost. He never says to a lost per person, maybe you're saved. He says you're saved or he says you're lost. Why? So that you'll get saved if you're not. So that you'll know that you're saved if you are. Realizing the roles of Satan and the Holy Spirit in the work of salvation today helped bring a lot of clarity to my mind about what is going on. And you thought I forgot about what we were talking about. We're talking about the assurance of salvation. But when somebody comes and they say, well, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'm not, maybe, I, maybe I'm not saved. It is not the Holy Spirit saying maybe. It is the work of the devil to say maybe. And so what do we need to do? Ignore it? Not at all. Not at all. Um, if we are, if I am right, and I believe I am, that nobody gets saved until they are lost. If I am right and I have the scripture to back it up, that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God, right? We read that a long time ago, so let's look at it again. Romans chapter number 8. We read it at the very beginning for our text verse. <clears throat> in verse number 16, the Spirit, capitalized in our King James Bible, meaning the Holy Spirit, itself bears witness with our spirit <clears throat> excuse me, lowercase s, meaning spirit of man, that we are the children of God. One of the most misquoted verses in the Bible, people often say, well, my spirit just bears witness with their spirit. I know they're saved. Well, listen, you might sense a fellowship, a relationship there, but that's not what that verse is talking about. That verse is saying the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So God who knows whether you're saved or not, the Holy Spirit confirms with you, yes, you are, or no, you're not. You with me? Say amen. So what I need to do, if I am wondering if I'm saved, I remember I've, I've used this illustration. I heard about an assistant pastor up in the, up in the Northeast that after, since he's been an assistant pastor, last count I had was nine, I believe. Nine times he has made professions of faith as an assistant pastor. And, the, and when I try to inquire into why that is happening, well, it turns out that every couple of years or every year or so, there's an evangelist that'll come through and he'll say, if you've ever doubted your salvation, you can't be saved. Because the Bible says, if you're saved, you're saved. And he wrote you these things so you can know it. And so if you've ever doubted it, that means you're not saved. And so, <clears throat> well, this guy, well, I, I have doubted it, so I guess I'm not saved. So he makes another profession of faith. And he prays, Lord, if I'm not saved, then save me. Did you catch it? If I'm not saved. And if thou be the Son of God. And if there's a heaven. And if hell is real, and if there is eternity, if there is life beyond this, and if, if, if. An if prayer is not a prayer of faith. Would you agree with that? Say amen. An if prayer is not a prayer of faith. So what I need to know, if I have a question, I need to know, yes, I am, 
or no, I'm not. Right? Amen? That's, what, that's, the, that's the question of the day. Who has the answer? God. Whose job is it to tell me? The Holy Spirit. What does he do? How does he do that? Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When the Holy Spirit began to put these things together in my mind, you almost get embarrassed about how simple it is and you couldn't see it. And how many times that you've doing the best you knew. By the way, you do the best you can with what you know, but when you know better, you do better, amen? But how many times over many years tell people, well, you know what to do. Okay, Lord, if I'm not saved, then save me. And they walk out of my office, and I'm just being honest with you in my heart. In my heart, as they walk out of my office, I don't know that they're any more assured than they were when they came in. As a matter of fact, can I just be transparent with you? Don't even really know what to announce. Did they get saved? I don't know. Were they already saved? I don't know. So what do we do? We invent this term. They got the assurance of their salvation. I'm not trying to invent a new doctrine. I'm trying to say, where did that come from? I, In that context, I, I, and I did not do the research, I'll be honest with you, I didn't do the research to find out when people started using that terminology. I, I don't know. Probably doesn't even matter. Might be interesting, I don't know. But I didn't even know what to announce. Did they get saved? Were they already saved? I have no clue. Well, they got the assurance of their salvation. And that sounded spiritual, but in my heart, I knew that I'd probably see them back in a matter of time. And I did. So, here, let me start to summarize here. You must know that you're lost in order to get saved. I, I, okay, let me say it this way. Until I know the answer to this question, there's nothing for me to do other than seek God. Until I know that I'm lost, I can't get saved. Until I know and have the assurance that I am saved, I can't really go on, go move forward anyway. I need, now there's, can I do something? Yes, I can spend time with God in prayer. And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. But there's no action for me to take until God tells me the answer. He's the one that has the answer. You say, well, me and God, we know. Well, listen, I'm here to tell you, we don't even know sometimes. Because I thought I was saved and there's going to be people that we read this morning that will stand and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name? They didn't know either. So who's the one that really knows? That's God. I'm not trying to make you doubt yourself. I'm just trying to point out something that sometimes we, what we think we know, we don't really know. It is the Holy Spirit's job to reveal it. So I must know that I'm lost before I get saved. Number two, God wants you to know more than you want to know. Well, I don't know, preacher, man, I really want to know. Yeah, but he gave his son to die on the cross of Calvary, sent the Holy Spirit, wrote the word of God, preserved it for 2,000 years to give it to you and to me. He wants you to know more than even you want to know. I realize it's your eternal destiny that's hanging in the balance. But trust me, God is not hiding the truth from you about whether you're saved or not. And look at all the trouble he's gone to so that you will know that you're lost so that you might know that you're saved. So I have to know I'm lost in order to get saved. Number two, God wants me to know. So number three, ask God to reveal it to you. Sometimes you have not because you ask not. Now, I don't, I, I'm not trying to get every saved person who's never doubted their salvation to, be, to, to start going to God on a daily basis saying, God, reveal to me if I'm not saved. I'm not talking about that at all. I am saying this. If you're someone that once in a while you just kind of doubt whether you're genuinely saved, ask God to tell you. Ask God to reveal it to you. Because something's going on. 
I know it's not God saying maybe. I know it's the devil saying maybe, but I don't know why he's saying maybe because I don't have that information. I just know he wants a lost person to think they're probably saved. He wants a saved person to think maybe they're not so that he keeps them either lost or not fruitful. I do know that. So ask God to reveal it to you. You say, preacher, is there anything else I can do? Well, here's, here's one last bit of help. You, I don't know if you thought I was going like, to give you the answer to your question tonight. I'm not. I'm trying to give you Bible principles to apply to either help. Now, there might be somebody here that this helps. There might be somebody here. Uh, let me say this. I, I, I almost, I've gone back and forth a half a dozen times today whether to say this or not. Because I do not want it to sound like I figured out something that the ancients had missed. Because I, I'm sure of this. I'm sure I'm not the only one that understands this. Matter of fact, I'm probably the guy that came late to the party. And I'm just super hard-headed and it just took me a long time to figure it out. But when I began to try to help people with this biblical approach, what I think is a biblical approach of understanding how the Holy Spirit works and how the devil works, the role of the Bible in it. Um, I've had some people that I, and I counsel people, look, you need to get alone with God and you need to ask God to reveal to you through the word of God, whether yes, you're saved or no, you're lost. Until he does that, there's nothing for you to do other than seek the face of God. And I've had some people come back I've had some people come back to me in months. I've had some people come back to me in hours, uh, just a few hours. Some have come back and said, thank you, preacher. The Lord confirmed in, in my heart. I know, I know I'm saved. I know what the devil was doing to me. And praise God, those people have, have not come back to me. Um, they've never come back and said, well, I'm still, I'm still doubting. I'm questioning again. Uh, still not sure. And why is that? Because I am so smart and wise? No, because I think they got their answer from God. <laughs> when God gives you the answer, that's, you don't need mom and dad to tell you that you're saved. You, you get God to tell you you're saved. That's the person you need to hear from. I've had some come back a few months, some back hours and say, okay, I got my answer. I know that I'm not saved. And when they prayed, they said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I know I'm lost. I'm on my way to hell. And best I know how, by faith, I accept Jesus Christ right now as my personal Savior. And I trust him. Forgive me of my sins. They come to God not with an if prayer. They come to God with an absolute prayer. And it settles it. And I am thrilled. Amazed and thrilled that it settles it. But how simple it is when we get our answer from God. When God confirms in us what man cannot confirm. Because you can come ask me all day long and I say, well, you know, I think you're, I see you. I've known you for years. You're a good person. I think you're safe. You know what? That might make you feel a little better, but it really doesn't give you the answer, does it? When God gives you the answer through the word of God. Now, here's the last help I said I was going to give you about five minutes ago. It means I haven't really helped you for five minutes. <laughs> the Bible is the sword of the Spirit. When I got saved, the Holy Spirit of God used the word of God to put the truths in my heart. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That, that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shall believe in thy heart that God will raise from the dead. Thou shalt be saved with the heart man believe in righteous, with righteousness, with the mouth confession is made of salvation. Those are truths from the word of God. But I want you to think about this. Those same truths bring, what, what did John, what did Jesus call the Holy Spirit in John? When the comforter is come, those verses bring comfort 
to the Christian. But they bring conviction to the lost. Amen? They bring comfort to the Christian. They bring conviction to the lost. And the last help I have for you, and again, and I, I am assuming, again, there, there might be somebody here that is actually helped by this in your own personal life. I don't know that. But I'm, my assumption is that I am helping you with your children in the future, your, your relatives, uh, that you're going to have some Bible answers to give them if they come to you and say, well, I'm not sure I'm saved. And again, somebody that's often false doctrine, this is not for them. They need the false doctrine corrected. But I am trying to help you. And so the best, the, the, the last help I have for you is get in the word of God and prayer and see whether God the Holy Spirit uses the scriptures to comfort you or to convict you. Because if he uses them to convict you, that may be your answer. If he uses them to comfort you, and I remember one specific lady uh, several years back that told me, came to my office and told me about when she had uh, made a profession of faith and she said, but I've always, just, just from time to time over my whole saved life, she said, uh, I've always gone through periods of time where I really just doubted whether I was saved because, because I, you know, would, I wasn't always what I ought to be. And, and, and by the way, when somebody would say that before, I'd say, well, you know, those things are not what saves you, so don't worry about it. But listen, that's the wrong answer. I don't know why they aren't, aren't doing what they're supposed to do. I, I have no insight on that. But I remember sharing with her what I just shared with you. And it was just a matter of a couple of months, I believe, that she came back. And just the sweet glow of the Holy Spirit on her face, joy and peace. And she said, preacher, I got my answer. I'm, I'm saved. God confirmed it through the word of God that I am a child of God. I, all I can go by is my own experience and she's never come back in all those years and revisited that. Maybe she has personally, I don't know. But I know that um, I believe she got her answer from God and his word. I believe the Holy Spirit did what the Holy Spirit is supposed to do. He confirms in us that we are the sons of God. Oh, how simple, but how profoundly deep that is. But the answer is right there if we let the Holy Spirit of God reveal it to us. I'll be honest with you. I do not feel smart or special because of what I've shared with you tonight. I feel kind of uh, biblically like, you know, stunted that it took so long for something so simple to get, you know, to formulate, you know, part, pieces to connect in my brain. And tonight I just want to say thank God for the Holy Spirit's comfort and for his confirmation. I do know this, that from the day that I trusted Christ at 21 years of age, I have never, I've often wondered why God loves me but I've never doubted that, I'm, that I am his. I've often wondered why he said, none of these things will separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I've often wondered why he didn't devise it differently, give us a three strikes rule and you're out and kick us out. I, I've often wondered that, but I've never wondered whether or not I was his. Because I know the, the Holy Spirit showed me that day and that I responded in faith, plus nothing, minus nothing, accepting Christ as my personal Savior to God be the glory. I know this is not super exciting. I hope it is affirming. hope it's helpful for you 
as well as preparing you to be helpful to someone else. But I think we can all say this, as I just expressed, God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that it settles it for me. I don't have to wonder anymore. It's, it's one of those things where I believe God has given me at least as much of an answer as A, I can handle, or B, that I need. I believe that. Father, maybe tonight we, the altar call, the invitation is different. Maybe it is for someone that I don't even know tonight might have questions, have had questions. And tonight they've gotten answers and they just want to come and say, God, thank you for the answers. Maybe it starts someone on finding the answers and that answer will come in the future. I don't know. Maybe, so maybe for them tonight it's an opportunity to say, God, I want you to... Not, not that we start not doubting and, and then but we're going to doubt just to see, but, but if there have been questions, maybe this puts us on the right road to get the answers. Maybe tonight is just good preparation for someone that we will encounter that has the truth of the word of God, but they've doubted in their hearts whether or not they were genuinely born again. And maybe now we're a little better equipped to help them. God, I pray that whatever the case is, that when we come to this altar tonight, we are saying thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for the revelation of it to us. Thank you for teaching us and guiding us into truth. Thank you for your help, your strength, and your comfort. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed as we stand to our feet.